guest today is Jeremy Beckwith. There he is, the Chief Investment Officer at Climate Benson, where he helps manage $13.1 billion in assets. And Jeremy is my guest for the next half an hour, so don't go away for that. Back to my guest today, Jeremy Beckwith, the Chief Investment Officer of Climate Benson. And many thanks indeed for coming in, Jeremy. Your first time on Bloomberg TV, I believe. That's right. So hopefully it'll be a good one. I hope so too. Uh, big call, Franny and Freddie are not enough. Uh, no, it, well, the rescue is not enough. I the rescue is not enough. It was necessary. They could not be allowed to to go under, so they had to do it. But it doesn't actually resolve some of the main issues still within the financial markets. And in particular, there's still huge amounts of debt problems I think out there within within the banking system. We've used the expressions dark clouds, toxic clouds, um, a long way to go. What's your take on it right now? Uh, there is still some more way to go. I don't know. There's necessarily a long way to go. I think we know most of the subprime uh, issues now. Uh, but the problem is that the, the, those issues have now sort of infected the real economy and we're now seeing substantial slowdown in the real economies around the world and that's going to lead to another round of credit problems. Is the worst behind us or is it because of the, the lending paranoia between the banks another situation that could be a bigger concern? I, I think the worst of the subprime issue is well behind us now but I think we've now entered a, a new problem. Um, looking overall at the economy as well, I mean, how does that feature in your thinking when looking at investments? I mean, is that going to be pretty bleak? We always say that... UK and Europe are six months behind the US, but of course yeah. the US, the first quarter of next year, with the new presence, might want to get all the bad news out of the way. So actually, down the tunnel is a barrel of a gun, isn't it? It could be quite bleak. That's right. The, the, the current situation in the world economy, almost all economies around the world are clearly slowing. Uh, and so it doesn't, doesn't look good for the next year or so. Uh, but markets, of course, move well ahead of, of economies. And so that doesn't necessarily mean the outlook for markets is quite so bad. Your forecast, though, is sell-off in the next few weeks. That brings me to October, which yeah. I've been saying, and I'm, I am doom and gloom, I'm afraid. Right. Historically, 87, 27, it's not a great month, is it? It's not a great... September and October between them are, are two, two very poor months. Uh, and the reason, there's a very good reason for that is that everybody comes back and for their budgets, uh, they look at previously what they hoped to make for the year, and now they really look at what they're really likely to make for the year, and it's nearly always lower. And so we will see, I think, substantial earnings revisions downwards over the next few weeks as we go through the third quarter reporting season. Today, Home Retail talked about a difficult September, October, November. So there's one company in retail, for example, saying until Christmas it's going to be a bit of a nightmare. Uh, I would, Which I would could be reflecting so. on the markets, couldn't it, as well? Uh, absolutely, and I think there's just one area of that's consumer, but I think all areas of the world economy are clearly slowing, uh, and I think we'd like to see earnings estimates reductions across the board. How does the intense, Jeremy, how does the intense uh, volatility affect your investment planning, if at all? I mean, it must be quite difficult to gauge what, what to do, when to do it. Uh, that's right. In, in sort of normal circumstances, absent the sort of bear market we're in now, then markets move in different ways at different times. Um, but there's a very old trading adage that in bear markets, the only thing that goes up is correlation. And we have seen that this year. And that almost everything you could buy as an investment has really, has really suffered this year. Warren Buffett always says that uh, when, when people are greedy, uh, be fearful. Yep. And when they're fearful, be greedy. Absolutely. Does that apply to this bear market? I think people are getting pretty fearful right now. And I think they're going to get a lot more fearful in the next few weeks. Um, but if you look at sort of cold, hard logic, so the dividend yields on most of the major world markets are really getting to quite attractive levels. Uh, and as long as you're comfortable those dividends are going to get paid, there is some real value when you compare dividend yields with bond yields or, or, or returns on cash. So we're, we're getting to sort of levels where a cold, a cold-headed sort of long-term investor will think, actually, this is quite good value. So climates are getting a bit greedy then, I would say. Almost. We're, we're, <laughs> we're thinking there's going to be an opportunity to be greedy, yes. Um, you've got these funds with the very heavy cash and you're looking to invest now. Is that part of the... The move shift into the markets? Yeah, we've, we've been really quite uh, cautious on markets over most of this year um, and built up substantial cash reserves, um, waiting for what we think is the right time. I think we need some sort of emotional sell off or capitulation or just real fear to enter the markets. And I think given there's real value there, I think that, that will offer an opportunity. And fear's not already in the markets, you're saying? There's some, but it, it, you have to wait till it gets to some sort of extreme. And, and uh, we, I thought last week we're just beginning to get there, and then they came out with the rescue of Fanny and Fred in this huge sort of short covering rally. I think we need to, that fear needs to build up again. You're making me nervous, but don't go away. You were nervous to start with. <laughs> I was, no, that's right. <laughs> up next, we'll be discussing our guest top stock picks, as well as getting more insight into Jeremy's investment strategy. Welcome back. Now, first of all, quick look at the markets. You can see the markets are opening lower. 
There they are, FTSE Frankfurt DAX, Paris CAC and Zurich SMI. I want to mention also the Barclays, as I'm speaking now, it's actually breaking. Barclays has cut its oil price forecasts, citing, citing weakening demand. They've cut their fourth quarter in 2009 oil price forecasts. 2010 is unchanged. They've cut their fourth quarter, just to let you know, oil forecast to $97, spot 50 a barrel, from 123, spot 90. And fourth quarter Brent oil forecast is down to 95, spot 90 from 122. So therefore Barclays there cutting their forecast. Could that be a trend? We'll see as time progresses. Now back to my guest, the man with the trends, Chief Investment Officer Climber Benson, where he helps control $13.1 billion in assets. Many thanks indeed for staying with us. Uh, interesting enough, you're also an MA in economics from Cambridge, so you're perhaps one of the best placed people to comment on the economy right, yes. uh, as a Chief Investment Officer. Mm -hmm. And also, you are a cricket umpire, a hobby, which is interesting yes. because I've never thought of any more job more difficult to decide on a, making a decision when everyone's shouting at you appeal. So under pressure, yep. basically, you have the economist hat, the umpire hat, mm -hmm. and a Chief Investment Officer's hat. Mm -hmm. So how, do you, how does this pressure compare to being on a field and dealing with the whole 11 people screaming at you, appeal, that's out? Uh, there's a lot of similarities. There are a lot of similarities. Um, both require you to make decisions under pressure, under some time pressure, in the face of limited information. Um, I, I enjoy both of those, uh, but doing it in both, both functions, and as I find, do, do find a lot of crossover. When do you relax? Um, oh, on the cricket field. That's uh, therapeutic, isn't it? Absolutely. To be under as much pressure. Yeah. So if a man likes the pressure as well, what do you tell your team in this difficult time when obviously you're saying the markets could be quite tricky for the next few weeks? Mm -hmm. uh, the extreme, as you say, is yet to come. Mm -hmm. What's your team feeling at Dresdner? Are they a bit nervous? T well, my team's very experienced. We've been yeah. through these sort of markets before. Uh, we understand markets go up and down. Uh, we understand why they're going down at the moment. But equally, we want to look through and, and just take an analytical, cold-hearted approach, really, to, to what's going on and think, well, actually, you know, there, are, there is value appearing here. Uh, and uh, let's make sure that when the time comes, we're ready to take, take advantage of it. What's on the radar when you look at it? What do you define as value? I know you mentioned earning certainty, mm -hmm. dividend yields. Yeah. I mean, what, what are the key criteria for saying this stock is now on the radar? We like this. Let's look at it. Uh, it's really saying, OK, if we imagine what's our worst possible case uh, and how bad could that be uh, and what's the, a stock or a market's value at that point, and if we can find it's cheaper than that, then that's value. Uh, and at some point you know that uh, trends will reverse themselves and when times are better uh, you'll get the opportunity hopefully to sell it for well above value. Is there any particular one that you look for? Many say book value, P ratio, valuation, um, good management, or the, all, all of the yeah, above? I, I've always thought for, market, for the end of bear markets you look at dividend yields. Uh, because that's real cash that companies pay you. Uh, and if they're happy to carry on paying you that cash, uh, then you know there's some, there's some underlying strength there within those companies. So when, when that dividend yield gets to a really attractive level relative to other assets, uh, I think that's, that's a very, those are very good signals for saying this is good long-term value. And a signal for saying get out of the stock would be? A signal for saying get out of the stock is when everybody loves it. Uh, right. And it's a little more, more sort of psychological. It's really, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And everyone's greedy. Be, be Afraid, be, be very afraid. Um, I do want to talk about, if I could, the pound, yep. the weakness. Now, you said in your notes, in fact, that it's actually going to help UK exporters. Yep. Obviously, the pound weakens, it helps their sales abroad. Mm -hmm. um, is that therefore a good reason? I mean, you like Rolls Royce at the moment, mm -hmm. you like Stagecoach, yep. about to join the FTSE in a few weeks' time. Yep. That's, a good, that's a good start. Um, good exposure, therefore. Uh, are these the reasons the pound weakening, why those companies, particularly Rolls Royce, is perhaps a good? investment at this, at this yeah, moment? Rolls-Royce in particular is, is one of the, the uh, companies most exposed to the dollar. Um, they, obviously they sell aero engines uh, and uh, they invoice in dollars for almost everything. Uh, so they have huge dollar exposure and although they hedge on a rolling five-year basis, well, that just sort of defers out the, the benefits and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the harm they get from, from a rising and falling dollar. So, but they, they still maintain that underlying exposure. And so, yes, we expect a weak pound, we expect also a strengthening dollar against other currencies. Uh, and so the, the Rolls-Royce on the currency grounds looks very well placed. But actually what's going on inside the company is also very interesting, very exciting. Uh, because five years ago they were seen to be a very cyclical company. Basically they made the money from selling the engines. Uh, and demand for air engines is, is very cyclical, it was up and down enormously. And they've changed the business mix dramatically now. So that actually more and more the revenues come from servicing those engines. And that has to be done every time the aircraft flies. 
So you've got a much more consistent stream of earnings coming through from Rolls-Royce. And it's valued on 10 times, which is the valuation you should get really for a very cyclical company when it's a much less cyclical company. So it's, it's, it's undervalued, we think. Uh, uh, and the, the wide body aircrafts that it makes actually are still in very good demand. They're much more fuel efficient than older aircraft, so it still pays airlines to invest in, in new aircraft, and, and that's where Rolls-Royce can really benefit. And John Rose has been the CEO of the company. I'm looking at my, looking at my facts here since 1996. Yeah. That's a fairly rare experience, isn't it? It is. It's a very long like time. Martin sold at WPP yeah. to be in the job that long in this current market. Yeah. But, and it, it's particularly useful in an industry like that where actually... And he's still fresh with the ideas, is he, John absolutely, Rose? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and what Rolls Royce do is make sure that the technological leaders uh, and uh, they, you have the same sort of set of clients uh, and as long as you've got the best products out there, which they have, then, then they're very well set. So you've been actively buying shares recently, have you? Yes, they, they sold off very, very hard over the summer because as the economic slowdown took hold, it's like a knee-jerk reaction in the markets. Uh, and the shares sold down very, very heavily, much more than I, I think is really, is really uh, warranted. And I think now is a good opportunity to get back in. You've got these funds. I want to ask you about how many funds there are. Some funds, all in the notes, some funds you set up, end of 2006, sitting on large cash reserves, you may start to invest now. What are the funds? How many of these funds are there? How much are they worth? Right. Uh, these are um, multi-asset funds uh, that we've created to ensure that our, for our clients we're as, we're as diversified as possible. Uh, across as many different asset classes as possible because for a very long time in the private wealth space uh, people were given the option of investing in equities and bonds and cash and that was it. But actually we've seen over the last five or ten years you can make a lot of money out of property and commodities and, and hedge funds as well. And a properly diversified por portfolio should have all of those things in it. And so we set up these funds in, in late 05 um, to really to be very, very diversified. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and we've done very well, uh, not only in, in the diversification has worked in reducing the volatility of the overall performance, which is what our clients care about. So wealthy individuals care very much about solidly consistent returns. Uh, and by having a, a really uh, cautious view on markets over this year, we've, we've managed to, uh, to uh, outperform a lot of our competitors o o over the course of the, of, the, of the last year and over the three years. Many are saying that perhaps investing in a distressed fund, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you deal with that, mm -hmm. is quite good. You've got, for example, um, uh, high-risk, high-yield bonds trading at distress levels the most in five years. Speculation, therefore, picking up the defaults are going to go up. It makes yes. a lot of sense in this market. Yes. Is, that, is that an avenue which you would explore at Dresden Climate? We, yes, we, we're researching the idea of, of distressed funds. There have been quite a few trying to launch recently, and we have not yet gone in because our take is that the credit crunch still has a way to go, and actually this is going to be quite a bad downturn in, in terms of defaults, uh, and therefore you don't want to be too early. So I think there's a bit of time left, but we're, we're researching the funds that we're, we're going to want to invest in, I would think maybe middle, late next year. It's catching a falling sword, isn't it, really? Absolutely. You have to be, you have to be, yeah, timing is really quite important. It's been on cricket field, basically. Yeah. Uh, or catch a ball, in fact. <laughs> um, let's also talk about, if, you, if we could, the banks themselves. You mentioned yourself, there's a long way to go in the credit crunch. Mm -hmm. There's only two banks that you say uh, that you would actually back, Goldman Sachs and HSBC, i.e. Yeah. two fairly solid uh, banks that have had good management track records, etc. HSBC has ha household in the US, which mm -hmm. clearly is a bit of an exposure. Mm -hmm. Some are saying the Asian story might weaken a bit in terms of growth. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be another concern for HSBC. But are they the only two banks that you see, right, OK, I feel safe with those. The rest, I'm not going to go near. Not the only two. They're the best two. Um, I think what you need for to be investing in banks in the future is, is size and scale. And you need proven quality management. And those two, I think, really have shown particularly the, they've navigated their way through this mess very, very well. And you know that when you come out the other side, they're going to be the strongest players. Uh, and those are the ones you're going to want to back, I think, uh, on, on a long-term view. What does the Lehman story say to you at the moment? It says the credit crunch isn't over. Uh, it's very sad. We might, we're going to lose another great investment banking name after Bear Stearns. Um, it tells you that this is a very serious problem that's going on. Um, you know, who would have said you know, six months ago we said that we would lose Bear Stearns, Fenny, Fenny, Freddie and Lehman's in the space of six months. Well, we haven't lost Lehman's yet, but it's looking likely. It's pretty amazing what's happened here. You know, these are big problems, big issues within, within the world's financial system. You say we're going to lose Lehman's, almost. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they've had a massive uh, rehash and rehab, if you like, of everything that they've done, setting off businesses, etc. But you're saying we're going to lose it. Well, so they, it seems they, that the time they, is gone. The CEO has effectively said they're up for sale. Uh, if someone came in and wanted to buy them, I, I'm sure they... I'm Would sure. they want to buy them, do you think? 
I don't know. Is it an attractive proposition? Uh, I don't know. Invest it seems to me the world has too many investment banks at the moment. So you see a lot of M and A activity, particularly investment banking community. Well, well, I, well I think what you will see is investment. You get smaller investment banks or fewer investment banks. Uh, right. It's, it's not very clear why people would would want to have um, want to be going into buying investment banks at the moment. What is the Jeremy Beckwith take on when do you think it's going to be? And this is a very hard question to answer. You haven't got a crystal ball, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, when are we going to be out of the woods? Many are saying, for example, the third quarter of next year. Right. Um, <clears throat> Well, it depends. I think in an economic sense, it's going to be quite a long, slow workout. Uh, and the best we can hope for is not a lot of growth, maybe 0 1% growth for a couple of years. And that's, so that will feel bad. But for markets, obviously, we, markets move much faster than that. And it could, it could easily be that we, see that we see the low in markets in the next few weeks, uh, especially if we get quite an emotional capitulation. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that's the start of a bull market. It just means that was the low. And, and things are just gradually getting a bit better from there in markets. Your price falling is obviously a help. Yes. Does it make you feel far more relaxed, if you like? Mm. Wrong word, but... Um, no, because the reason the oil price is falling is because the economy is weak. Uh, and so, so that means earnings are more likely to fall. Um, but it, what it does do, most importantly, is it reduces the inflation pressures in the world economy and that will allow the central banks to stop worrying about inflation, particularly the Bank of England and the ECB, and actually begin to look at the weakness of their economy and beginning to do something about that. So I would think that next year we will much more likely to see quite substantial policy action from the Bank of England in particular and, and hopefully also the ECB. Jeremy, many thanks indeed for coming. And Jeremy Beckworth, uh, the CIO, the Chief Investment Officer of Climate Benson, joining me, where he helps manage $13.1 billion. Very wise words, too. My guest tomorrow will be William de Vilder.